Hello everybody, this is Brad Dyke, and I'm putting out another video. Yeah, two in one day. That's surprising. But the reason why I'm doing this video is because I'm getting a lot of questions about, hey, you know, I got my hands on this disc array. Or uh, they're mostly saying, hey, I, I see this disc out there, and I want to buy it, this disc array. And, you know, it could be a 2.5 inch disc array, or it could be a, a 3.5 inch disc array. And, uh, you know, the good question is, what is a disc array? Good question. A disc array is comprised of basically capacity discs, like for instance you see down here a 3.5 inch disc NAS device designed to provide temporary storage or remote storage, or you go all the way up to 2.5 inch, or you go to what we call a server chassis type array, or just a bunch of discs, J-O-B arrays. These are very low cost and they're very common out there. And they come from HP or they come from NetApp or they'll come from, yep, EMC. It's still out there. But the whole point of this is you get your access to maybe buy one of these. Maybe we should just take a second and think about that. So if you get your, your heads up to a disk array that could be like a three-part disk array from HP or a NetApp array or something like that, you know, the very first thing you want to ask yourself is this. What do I need? Well, let's say you need capacity, but you don't really care about transfer speeds. Just something that could back up what I got. Like you like to take a lot of photos. So that could lead you to picking out a NAS. That's a network access storage device that uses TCP IP to transfer data. Uh, let's say though you're an expiring um, IT guy and you've got a couple of old servers and you need to add capacity to the servers so what you've got is instead what we call a SATA or a SAS disk array. Okay, so here we have two types of classes of direct attached storage. We have what's called the SATA or eSATA devices, which you can buy. And these are basically iStock uh, uh, arrays. Or you can have yourself what we call a direct attach array. Now, before we get too much into that, the other question is the size of the disks. Why? Well, you noticed that NASes, you know, when you have them, a lot of them seem to be geared for the big disks, the 3.5 inch disks. Why? Because when you compare them to the 2.5 inch disks, you're talking about a major size difference, right? Yes, you are. What's the benefit of these large disks? Well, one, platter space. They have more capacity. And because they have more capacity, they actually can do a lot more handling of data over time across the multiple platters of these disks using a more traditional SATA style interface or an IP NAS interface like you see here. Again, this connects to the back of your PC or to your server, and this connects to your local network. So you can use it as a device. Direct Attach Storage, or DAS, is not like either of these two interfaces. This is SAS. Before SAS, it was also known as SCSI. It's a serial computer, uh, it's a serial computer interface platform that allows you to communicate in a way so it's faster, more efficient, and can get data to here in a more effective way. So now, we're starting to talk about some things that sound a little technical. One is this word SAS, S-A-S, versus SATA. Well, what's so special about them? Well, okay, good question. This is a 3.5 inch SATA connection. And if you look there, you'll see that the baseline interface right here has a little L-shaped connection. That's a very distinctive co connector specifically designed in dealing with SATA. Now, here is a 2.5 inch version of the same kind of configuration. And as you look, again, there's the little L shapes in the middle, one for the power and one for the SATA. Now, these two classes of hard drives, one is designed for basic uh, reduced format, which means it does give you some performance increase and uh, mobility and or compaction. The other one is a more traditional style device as we've known for many, many years, but it has more planar surface areas, so therefore you can get very large capacity drives at 3.5 inch. But they're, they're SATA, SATA. 
Serial interface is what we're talking about. It means one path in, one path out. So it's an Achilles heel of SATA. Yeah, it is. But if you have additional features such as making sure the hard drives you get have better caching on board, they have memory in the hard drive itself, and these things do help speed up the process of serial in, serial out data communication pathways. But it is basically just one highway. So with that being said, okay, what's better than this? Well, let's look at SAS. Now, if you look at SAS, SAS does not have the two little L shapes in it at all. It's more of a straight edge, which means it's not compatible if the interface channel isn't able to handle it. Now, that's important. The reason why they did this is because when you look at this, and then you look at this, there are actual buses out there that can actually receive both connections. And there are other bu bus interfaces out there that cannot. What do I mean by that? This is a basic SATA interface platform. When I open up these channels and I choose to take these drives out, I will have at my disposal the ability to look deep inside there and I will see the interface. Now this is a SATA only bus. Very important. So when you're going to go out there and buy yourself a shelf, you've got to make sure you understand what it will connect to. Because in the back of the other style connections, you can see that they can handle both SATA or SAS. And they can handle them in mixed mode, which means you can have in this bay right here, as you can see, which has five slots in it, or yeah, five slots in it, that I could have two that are SATA and, and three that are SAS. Not a good idea, but it's doable. It's compatible. And that's an important detail to understand. Higher performance capacity systems, such as the NetApps, have more focused on making sure that you don't mix them too much, but you can mix them. Just check out my other videos on that particular detail. Okay, so we've covered hard drives that are big, hard drives that are small, and we've covered SATA connectivity, which is single write pathways. And now we're talking about SAS. And we understand now that SAS is something a little bit better. Actually, it's a lot better. It has dual write pathways, not single, but two, which means it actually communicates pretty fast. So when you're working with a SAS environment and you're a DBA or you're an aspiring database manager or you're an aspiring data manager or something like that, this is valuable because when you're handling your data, you don't want to sit there twiddling your thumbs for 10 or 15 hours waiting for data to transfer. No, you don't. What you want to do is you want to make sure that when you have this set up in such a way that you're using this for performance needs. Now, we have one major, major variable in this equation, and that is SSDs. Yep, here's a two gig, I'm sorry, two terabyte BX500 series, 2.5 inch SSD drive. Actually, it's not very big. It's about this size total but it's in a cartridge that allows it to fit inside either the SAS or the SATA. Now, for the most part, these drives cost money. This is not a cheap drive. I can get these in surplus, and I can get these out on eBay in bulk, and I can get these even cheaper. But these not necessarily. But it's exciting, though, because right now we're looking at 1,000 IOPS here and here, and we're looking at about 2,800 IOPS here. IOPS, by the way, is your basic input-output bandwidth. But this guy right here is a lot, lot, lot more. Now, I don't think specifically on this, but I think the transfer rates will put this close to about roughly 50,000 IOPS. That's pretty doggone good, especially if you have a bunch of them, because they add up. They give you more bandwidth as you're working together. Now, I know all of a sudden it's exciting. Hey, I can go out. I'll spend, some, I'll spend the money. I will buy this stuff, put 20, 30 SSD drives in there, one terabyte each, and I'm set. I've got my performance. I can blow all these other hard drives out of the water, and uh, no, not really. Here's the problem. You see, 
when you go after and you get your hands on a disc array, maybe a SATA or a SAS array or an old NAS or something like that, there's one Achilles heel. And that is what we call basically the controller. This controller is your interface. This guy keeps it all coordinated. This guy coordinates the capacity of what you have. And the thing about controllers is that when you're working with them, you have to understand the controllers were designed to work with spinning disks. So what am I talking about here? Well, this is an LS series controller. It's a SAS controller and it can do SATA. This one particular one can go up to 24 drives on each channel. So that's 48 drives total. It's a highly competent and very functional platform and has a cache buffer here. It has the ability of maintaining its caching and it's got a really decent processor chipset. It's a good card. It's a really good card, actually. And in this particular series, I think this is a P400 that I'm looking at. Mostly used in DL series HP servers. But some of these controllers can get really, really, really big. This is a P800 and it has three redundant battery powers up with it and it has its cache buffer, and it has the ability of handling the capacity. So yeah, this thing looks awesome, doesn't it? It's huge. But the reality of the fact is, it's designed for rotating spinning disks. Yep, the most basic of hard drives. They were never designed to handle SSDs. The reason why is that when you're dealing with NVMe, which is more of a stylistic device. It's very small, very thin, and it's a very proprietary interface, unlike these drives here. And you're dealing with SSD drives, which are the next step up from NVMe, which is a high-performance overall drive. The challenges are very simple. When dealing with capacity, size reduction is important, but also the ability to take full advantage of the bandwidth of PCIe. That's this little edge connection here. This is an I.O. card, a basic input-output card, that takes an NVMe drive, which fits just underneath this copper shield, and will slide into your motherboard. And this is a compatible one that works with older systems. Really gives great performance. Excellent. And as you can see, its contacts are a lot more detailed compared to the SSD interfaces. Now, SSD works on SATA, and this is a replacement drive to phase out SATA drives. They want to do memory drives. It is memory. There is no moving part. It's very thin, very functional. But what if you can negate the capacity of the limitations of a SATA controller or a SAS controller and go with something that's more direct bus on the motherboard itself and allow you to be able to improve your bandwidth capacity? Now, the problem with this is this. If you went out and bought a bunch of SSD drives to put into your new controller, let's say it's a 2.5 inch NetApp chassis, yes, they'll work. They'll come up, they'll do everything you want them to do. But what won't happen is they won't perform because the pipes are pretty limited on your controllers. They weren't designed for it. That's the flaw of SSD controller interfaces today. The NVMe is a way to get around that problem. You know, it's small, it's very tight, it's very compact. It gets a little warm, that's why you got a heat sink on it. But this bus directly goes on to the motherboard itself. So, as you can see, when you look at this bus speed, and the fact that it can go down on the motherboard itself, the overall pathways are direct. So, this hard drive is going directly to the PCIe bus of this motherboard, even though this is an old motherboard, it would give you the ability of getting into the pipeline much faster on this chassis than you would have with a traditional style controller like this that is supposed to do all the work here. But again, it's not fast enough. So it literally has to slow things down when you're looking at high-end drives like SSD drives because that's what it was designed for. And this is a normal issue we have in the storage industry in general because we've reached the limitations of spinning disk but the reality of the fact is, true, I don't need that performance. I don't necessarily have to deal with that. What I can do is put my money in disks that are going to be more functional. So the real question is, okay, how do I want to do that? 
what's the best answer in regards to that? You know, when I'm working with this, should I go small? Well, I would say go SATA, go small, go big. I understand it's not going to transfer rapidly, but it does a decent job. But let's say, hey, you know what? I'm going to be running databases from my server to something that I need to attach to it. Then I would say go a little farther. You probably won't find these cheap in higher capacities, but you can put more of them together in a SAS format and they perform faster to meet your needs as long as they're running through a controller interface. Not necessarily something that would be more proficient for a NAS or an IP storage device. So that would be my recommendation there. Home storage for files and stuff like that for backup, go SATA, go NAS. Go SAS and just stick to the old hard drives because they work really well. And that will allow you to be able to do things. Go 2.5 in general if you can. Most chassis will have screws for both the 3.5 inch and for the reduced 2.5 inch. So that's not necessarily a problem. It's just a matter of heat, airflow, and reduction of, of how much space is going to cost you. And or you want to just put a lot of them together. So that comes to the last part. Putting them together for what you need. Like I said, go to a NAS device if you're going to deal with basic backup storage or family storage capacity. Secure it well. But it'll do good and you can get cheap hard drives or re reuse old drives. It'll do what you want to do. It'll have some limitations to it. Mostly just your local network bandwidth speed. And that's it. But if you're dealing with a server and you want high performance, go with a server chassis. Don't do an external disconnection. Don't try to do an external array like this. Go for a bigger chassis or a more functional chassis such as this 720DX that can handle 24 hard drives up front. It's got quad processors inside. It's a server with hundreds and hundreds of gigs of RAM and it's directly running your DBAs they want. If you're running for services and interfaces, then yeah, I would go down here, add in a disk, a disk array, a SAS disk array, and it will be supportive of your functional database work that you're trying to do. So with that being said, that's really a good answer. Now, the last question is, what if I just have a, a JOB array, and that's this right here, which basically is nothing but power and spinning disks that are either SATA or SAS, and they'll use a SAS connection to go up to the server. So the last question, if you've got yourself, let's say a junker, right? An old something that's old SATA, SATA 2.0, but you can play with it and experiment with it. You know, the other question is going to come up, RAID. Do I do it in RAID format, which is redundant array of inexpensive disks? Or do I do it as an HBA, host best adapter style approach, where I just recognize each of the individual disks as individuals and then let the operating system, <coughs> such as TrueNAS or Microsoft Server or Linux, to deal with those disks and create a software-like configuration. The truth of the matter is, you're doing RAID no matter what. Um, RAID can be hardware, which is a RAID controller, native to the hardware, to the motherboard. No headaches, as long as it's compatible to what you're trying to run for your software, and it's just a single disk. Let's say you take 24 disks and you make them into one big giant drive. Well, that's all you see is one big giant drive. Now, it has redundant disks in it, and it will have replacement hot swap disks in it. You'll learn about that as you investigate that role. And that's RAID. That's doing RAID hardware-wise on the controller, using a RAID controller. HBA is the opposite. You know, it's just basically a single controller that gives recognition of each individual hard drive. It passes the basics, moves it onto the operating system, and you take it from there. It works. Um, if you really want to get into nitty-gritty stuff, you can. Uh, you're basically redoing RAID, but you're doing it after the operating system comes up. And if you want to do something like a piece of software like TrueNAS, load it on an old server with a couple of disk arrays, you want to use it as your home repository, or you just want to build the, the Frankenstein JOB's platform, go for it. HBA all the way. Neither one are bad. Neither one of them are good. You know, they have their, their, they have their performances and their capacity. And many, many, many times, I'll do both. 
I'll have my RAID controllers doing the crucial stuff, such as the operating booting systems and so on, while I have an HBA going out there and doing all the disk arrays that I'll put in ta tandem behind the server. So with that being said, this is just to help you to decide, do I do a disk array with SATA, SAS, SSD, and so on? Don't do SSD. You're wasting your money. The hardware that's, that's available to you today can't use it. Give it some more time. There'll be new stuff coming out. Maybe you can do it at that point stage. Unless you've got a pile of cash, you really can't do it. And if you do, you go straight to NVMe and you'll be very happy. Uh, you'll never be able to take full advantage of that kind of speed yet. Down the road, maybe. But this is about the poor guy like myself who once at a time could get my hands on some old gear and I'm playing and I'm building and I'm having some fun. Rock and roll. That's what this is about. So God bless. I hope you guys like this video. If so, please like and uh, or join up with the group and I'll take it from there. Thanks. Bye.